Hi, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is. As always, happy whatever day it is you're watching this. Welcome to Left Side of the Aisle. I'm your host, my name is Larry Erickson, and for the next eh, roughly half hour, I'm going to be ranting away at you about things important to me and that I think are worthy of your attention. If you have any reactions to the show or questions or comments, you can email me. My email address is whoviating, W-H-O-V-I-A-T-I-N-G, at AOL.com, or you can go to my website, Lotus Surviving a Dark Time, and you can leave a comment there, or you can uh, get the email address from there. So... Oh, and if you do email me, just please remember to include something like left side of the aisle, your cable show, or something like that in the subject line, so I know it's not spam, and um, be a little patient. I'm kind of slow about answering email, but I do answer it, so you will get an answer. All right, with that, we're going to start off with a couple of updates of things I have talked about before. And the first one I'm going to say is, you heard it here first, folks. You heard it here first. Remember the IRS scandal? Remember how the IRS was targeting Tea Party groups as part of some uh, uh, nefarious scheme against conservative organizations? Well, seven weeks ago, I told you that that was a phony so-called scandal, that it was missed vapor. Six weeks ago, I told you that for all of the fuss and feathers, the only group that had actually lost its tax-exempt status was a liberal group. Well, the whole business has now evaporated. It was, in fact, vapor. For one, it turns out that it wasn't only groups with things like Tea Party in their name that were being targeted for extra scrutiny. There are a lot of other flags, including words like progressive, occupy, Israel, and open source software, and no, that last one's not a joke. For another, it also emerges that the entire reason that the Treasury Inspector General uh, wound up highlighting scrutiny of conservative groups in this, but not liberal ones, is that the creepy crawly uh, chair of the House Oversight Committee, Daryl is a jerk, uh, told the Inspector General to focus narrowly on conservative groups, basically told him to ignore the rest. The whole scandal is a fake, a fraud, a setup, a lie, and I have absolutely no compunction about saying I told you so. All right, our other update, something else I told you about. This was two weeks ago. Something that uh, has still received scant media attention, but is starting to get some other attention. Supreme Court decision in case of Salinas v. Texas, in which a man named Genevieve Salinas was convicted in murder based partly on prosecutors arguing that his not answering some police questions was evidence of his guilt. The Supreme Court, in a truly creep-you-out, circular logic kind of ruling, said that because Salinas had not yet been arrested, there was no need to read him his Miranda rights, and because he had not positively stated he was invoking his right to, uh, to silence, which is what telling you the Miranda rights is supposed to let you know you can do, he had no constitutional protection against his silence being used against him. Well, it turns out that this decision, while largely ignored by the media, is getting attention and happily negative attention in legal circles. For one example, uh, Edward Chermanensky, he's the Dean of First Amendment Law at the University of California, Irvine School of Law, said that, quoting him, constitutional protection should not be just for those who have the legal training and know what they need to say to police in order to invoke their rights. Salinas was penalized for exercising his constitutional right to remain silent in the face of police questioning. This should not be tolerated under the Fifth Amendment. And his is not the only opinion that's been saying that of late. Hopefully there'll be a lot more of that kind of thing so that enough people will know about this and that this knowledge will be enough to deter cops and prosecutors from trying to take advantage of this gaping new hole gouged out of your constitutional rights. In the meantime, if a cop asks you about pretty much anything, say, I am invoking my rights under the Fifth Amendment to remain silent and then shut up. All right, from there, we're going on to one of our regular weekly features, the outrage of the week. Well, it turns out that the Obama administration has finally decided to take on the pharmaceutical industry, the generic pharmaceutical industry in India. The White House and members of Congress are pressuring India to change its patent laws for the benefit of U.S. drug corporations. Now, public health experts say that inexpensive drugs from India have become essential to providing life-saving treatments for people around the world uh, for a number of different conditions and diseases, and, but, but I'll give you just three examples of this. 
First, about 98% of the drugs uh, purchased by the International AIDS Relief Program that was established under the George Bush administration, about 98% of those drugs come from India. They cost about a dollar a day or about $365 a year. The non-generic form produced by Pfizer cost $10,000 per person per year, 30 times as much. Last year, India permitted a generic manufacturer to produce a, a cheaper version of a cancer drug that's been patented by Bayer. Bayer was charging $5,000 a month for this drug, while only servicing about 2% of the people who actually need it. The generic version costs $157 a month. Bayer's version costs 32 times more. More recently, Novartis uh, tried to extend its patent in India on a leukemia drug called Gleevec. Uh, and they, the extension was based just on the fact that they made a pill version of the medication. In January, India's Supreme Court said, no, that's not a legitimate innovation. Gleevec costs upwards of $75,000 a year in the United States. In India, where the annual per capita income is about $1,400, Novartis was charging $31,000 a year for this medication. The generic version cost one-fifteenth as much. The bottom line is that low-cost generics from India have dramatically lowered medical costs for people in the developing world. But by that very fact, they have also cut into the profits of Pfizer and Bayer and Novartis and others. And of course, we just can't have that. What's more, those same corporations have a deep fear that India's practice may spread to other countries. It may give other countries ideas. This is a process that these companies and their supporters call contagion, as if it was a disease that needed to be stamped out, which I suppose to them it is. So given the choice between, between uh, providing sucker for the poor and the sick around the world and providing sucker for uh, giant corporations in the industrialized West, there was just no competition. So we've had the U.S. Patent Office and uh, the Office of U.S. Trade Representative pressuring the Indian government on its patent standards. And just last week, Secretary of State John Kerry made a trip to India where, according to a department PR flack, Kerry, quote, discussed a number of economic and trade issues with Indian officials, including ongoing issues in the pharmaceutical sector. Last week, a bipartisan group of 170 members of the House sent a letter to Kerry and Obama grousing about India's patent system, and that was followed by a House hearing on June 27th that spent most of its time soaking up the whining of one Roy Waldron, the chief intellectual property officer of Pfizer, and happily nodding away as he bizarrely claimed that imposing U.S.-style intellectual property regulations on India that is essentially giving monopoly control of India's medication supply to U.S. and European corporations, would, and yes, he actually said this, it would help develop a more robust and innovative medical system in India. And all this is coming despite the fact that, uh, that Nirapama Rao, who is the India's ambassador to the United States, According to her, more than 85% of all of the patents issued in India for pharmaceutical inventions between 2005 and 2011 belong to foreign corporations. But apparently 85% is not enough for them. Well, two weeks ago, I told you how uh, Big Pharma uh, have become notorious for manipulating patent laws uh, to keep their greedy hands in our pockets. Now, patents are supposed to last normally for about 20 years. But uh, the pharmaceutical corporations have often succeeded in getting patents renewed by either claiming a new use for an existing drug or by getting a secondary patent for the drug based on nothing more than a minor reformulation or a change in delivery. Say, instead of by injection, it's now by pill. This practice is known as evergreening. And it's opposed by the World Health Organization specifically and precisely because of its effect on the availability of medicines for the world's poor. The blunt fact is that people around the world are dying unnecessarily because of the greed of big pharma. Greed embraced, endorsed, and urged on by Congress and by Obama. And if that can be anything but a gross moral outrage, 
I can't imagine what else would be. That is the outrage of the week. All right, before I break, one more thing. From the bad to the sort of good, at least, we have a hero award. The hero award is given as occasion merits to people who just do the right thing on a matter big or small. On Tuesday evening, June 25th, Wendy Davis, a Texas state legislator, uh, se state senator, I should say, from Fort Worth, strode onto the floor of the Texas Senate and started talking and talking and talking. She talked for more than 11 hours without a break. Texas Goppers are trying to use a special session of the state legislature to ram through a bill that would dramatically limit access to abortion in the state. It would cut the number of legal clinics from 42 to 5 in the entire state of Texas, and it would ban abortions after 20 weeks in direct violation of Roe v. Wade. So Wendy Davis said she was going to filibuster this bill and run out the clock on the legislative session. The legislative session ended uh, at midnight Wednesday morning. So she got up and she talked. Now, the filibuster rules in Texas are strict. She couldn't be off topic, and she talked. She couldn't take a bathroom break, and she talked. She couldn't eat or drink, and she talked. She couldn't even lean on anything, not even her own desk, and she talked. Finally, shortly before the midnight deadline, the goppers in the state Senate came up with the three points of order necessary to force her to yield the floor. But supporters used up another hour in their own parliamentary maneuvering, challenging the points of order. Finally, with about 15 minutes to spare, it looked like the reactionaries were going to get their way. And that's when it happened. The hundreds of supporters who had gathered in the galleries erupted in shouts and chants of shame, shame. They were so loud, so insistent, that Lieutenant Governor uh, David Dewhurst tried to shout at his microphone to call for the final votes. No one could hear him. State police grabbed, shoved, and pulled people out of the galleries. By the time orders were restored and the right-wingers had passed the bill by a vote of 19 to 10, the official time stamp read 12.03 a.m., too late. The bill had failed. The bill had been killed by Wendy Davis, some parliamentary work, and what immediately became known as a people's filibuster. Sadly, the bill won't stay dead long. Governor Rick Oops Perry has already said that he's going to call another special session of the state legislature to try to ram through his twisted notion of what constitutes protecting life. But at least now, the reactionaries know this will not go down without a fight. And as the symbol of that fight, Wendy Davis is a hero. And we are taking a break. And we're back. And welcome back. Um, we're going to go right now uh, to our other regular weekly feature, the Clown Award. This is given for acts of meritorious stupidity. This week, the winner of the Big Red Nose is Pennsylvania State Representative Daryl Metcalf. The last Thursday, State, uh, State uh, Representative Brian Sims of Philadelphia, and he's actually the first openly gay member of the Pennsylvania State Legislature, but uh, Sims attempted to take the floor to talk about the Supreme Court's decision striking down the Defense of Marriage Act. Uh, instead of doing that, several other members of the legislature used a procedural maneuver of objecting to, what he, to him to keep him from speaking, and then they did the same thing to, to other people to try to speak in Sims' support. Only one of those lawmakers who did this would admit to the, uh, making an objection. That was Daryl Metcalf. He said, I'm quoting, I did not believe that as a member of that body that I should allow someone to make comments such as he was preparing to make that ultimately were just open rebellion against what the word of God has said, what God has said, and just open rebellion against God's laws. In other words, according to Metcalf, you say what the Bible says or you don't get to say anything at all. Metcalf is from Butler, Pennsylvania, which is named for Major General William Butler, who was killed at the 1791 Battle of the Wabash, also known as St. Clair's Defeat, which stands as the worst defeat ever inflicted by the U.S. Army, uh, on the U.S. Army by Native Americans. All of which seems appropriate since Metcalf's brain also seems to have died a couple of hundred years ago. Daryl Metcalf is a clown. 
Oh, and by the way, as a footnote to this, on Thursday, Sims and Representative Steve McCarter announced their intention to introduce a measure to allow same-sex marriage in Pennsylvania. All right, for the rest of the show, I'm going to be talking about something here. Um, this show will be seen during the 4th of July week, 4th of July week and weekend. So um, I hope you enjoy your 4th. I uh, hope you get to see some fireworks or watch a parade or I hope you had to get to have a cookout or a barbecue or a picnic or, or I hope you just get to loll in your yard or on your couch with a cool drink and, you know, watch the tube, whatever. The 4th is time for fun and I hope you get your share. Uh, of course, though, it's also a day for uh, a patriotism of celebrating our nation and our heritage. So let me start by reminding you just what it is we are supposed to be celebrating, what the heritage is that we are supposed to be honoring. Quoting here, We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by the Creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed, that whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish it, and to institute new government, laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its powers in such form, as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. Prudence indeed will dictate that governments long established should not be changed for light or transient causes, and accordingly all experience hath shown that mankind are more disposed to suffer while evils are sufferable than to right themselves by abolishing the forms to which they are accustomed. But when a long train of abuses and usurpations, pursuing, pursuing invariably the same object, evinces a design to reduce them under absolute despotism, it is their right, it is their duty to throw off such government and to provide new guards for their future security. That is the second paragraph of the Declaration of Independence, which was adopted on July 4th, 1776, which is why July 4th is the holiday. Which means the fourth is about celebrating a history of revolution, celebrating the right of people to resist oppression. That history, that principle, should form the basis of our patriotism. So the fourth, again, is an appropriate time to talk about patriotism, and that's what I'm going to do. Now, I'm going to admit at the top, those of you that are regular viewers may note this, that some of what I'm going to say are things that I said to you just five weeks ago. Uh, I don't care. It bears repeating. Thing is, I never used to think of myself as patriotic. In fact, I never used to think about it much one way or the other. Uh, I actually started thinking about what patriotism is, what it means to me, thinking of principles and beliefs and so on in the context of patriotism um, during the presidential campaign of 2008. During that campaign, Barack Obama made a speech defending his patriotism, in the course of which he went out of his way to attack the anti-war activists and the counterculture of the 1960s. Bluntly put, he was defending his patriotism by attacking that of others, including me. Sadly, too many people, especially among politicians, follow suit with that. They make patriotism a matter of political or personal gain rather than substance, a matter of ostentatious display of flag pins and, and the star-spangled banner and swirling music and fluttering flags. In fact, next time you see a political debate, amuse yourself. Notice how many of the guys in that debate are all dressed in red, white, and blue. Red tie, white shirt, blue suit. Check it out. Well, personally, now... I say that patriotism measured in terms of wearing flag pins, of having your heart over the national anthem uh, and the like, I regard that as worthless, dangerous, and shallow. It's a hollow patriotism, a shell that prefers substance to reality and too easily, uh, as we have often, uh, that we've often seen over the last years, slides too easily from patriotism into jingoism. As even now, People who, had they done this to the British government in 1776, we would be hailing them in our school history textbooks as great heroes, here are being called traitors, and yes, I am thinking of Edward Snowden and Bradley Manning. Before I go any further, by the way, don't bother claiming that I said wearing a flag pin is shallow. I said no such thing. I said a patriotism measured in those terms is shallow, and it is. So... Here's my understanding of patriotism. 
Some years ago, I read the comment that, uh, about patriotism that it is natural to have an abiding affection for the land of one's birth. And I can completely agree with that, and I do. But going beyond that, I say being an American, being a U.S. patriot, means being dedicated to the ideals on which this country was supposedly founded. Ideals that at its best moments it strives to live up to in as full a measure as it can. Ideals such as life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, as the right to rebellion against oppression, as promoting the general welfare, as political freedoms, as representative government of, by, and for the people. The ideal of, to sum it up in a single phrase from the preamble to the Constitution of an intent to establish justice. A justice, I say, must include the economic and the social as well as the political if it's to have any real meaning. Patriotism, that is, as far as I'm concerned, lies in the devotion to the ideals, not in any outward symbolic expression of it. So I don't wear a flag pin. I don't put my hand over the heart, my heart during the national anthem, which, by the way, I was told as a kid is something that some people do and some people don't, but was not required. I don't sing along with the national anthem, and although I know some people will say I undermine my own argument this way, I don't care, it's the truth, I don't stand up for the national anthem. Patriotism does not lie in symbols. Further, patriotism does not lie in support for or opposition to any party or any policy, except as that opposition or support is based on those principles. For example, we're supposed to be a free people, which means... An opponent of the Iraq war who was angered by the executive branch's us usurpation of power was much more patriotic than a war supporter who kept referring to the president as commander in chief as if, as if we were all soldiers required to obey orders than a free people with the duty of any free people to question authority. We're supposed to be a daring people. We, we, we applaud ourselves for our daring, how we, we dared to cross the oceans, we dared to cross the plains and prairies, we dared to step out into space. That means, however, that an opponent of NSA spying is more patriotic, is more in keeping with that notion of daring, is more in keeping with what we like to tell ourselves is our heritage than those who applaud the stripping away of our privacy and our rights as they cower in fear of a dark and vaguely defined other. So I'm not patriotic as the term unfortunately has come to be defined by too many people. No flag pins, no singing the national anthem, none of that. But if patriotism can be understood as embracing the ideals of our nation, as striving to hold this country to the highest of those ideals rather than the lowest of its prejudices, if it can be understood as committing to a notion of the U.S., of what we as a people can be and have at times approached being, then I submit to you that I'm as patriotic as they come. And I have neither patience nor tolerance, patience with nor tolerance for, those who would make patriotism a matter of gestures and symbols and decorations rather than conviction. Now the fact is, even many professional grouches, like me, for example, are actually unregenerate romantics. Our sharp words are, high, are honed on the inexplicable, the unexplainable, the un, and yet still unshakable conviction that things not only should be, but can be better than they are. Some years ago, I wrote to a friend that our strongest, surest beliefs are those we don't even know we have until we find them within us. That is, our deepest, most abiding beliefs, uh, they're not born of rational argument and, and uh, philosophical uh, uh, um, analysis, but they grow naturally out of our root moral and ethical convictions. That argumentation, that analysis can give shape and form to those beliefs, but it doesn't drive them. It's driven by them. So... Despite my tendency to try to argue points rationally, to try to say, here's the data, here's the facts, here's the conclusion, um, from time to time, it becomes, and by the way, one of my favorite phrases is, uh, passion and substance are not mutually exclusive. Uh, from time to time, it's wise for me to try to drop away to that point where I can just say, I believe. I believe that life is our highest good and that advancing life is our highest ideal. I believe that whatever advances life, whatever improves life, is an expression of our humanity, that self-awareness, that capacity for love, that reach for hope, that separates us from the other animals of the earth.
I believe that that which opposes life, which advances hunger, oppression, and death, are a rejection of that quality, a rejection of our humanity. And I believe that to be human is to reach for our potential, and I believe that is patriotic. I believe in family, but a broad, deep sense of family, a family based on commitment, not on ceremonies, on ties of the heart, not on ties of the blood. I say we must reach beyond the personal to the public, beyond self to others, beyond us and them to we, beyond self to the community. And I say that is patriotic. I believe we have social obligations, moral commitments to a type of extended family of people we'll never see, never meet, never have any connection with, but with who we share a mutual moral duty, a community extending even to the community of humanity. And I say that is patriotic. I believe we must ultimately reject the right of so few to have so much when so many have so little, that we must resist the power of so few to control so much when so many control so little. I believe in the right of every human being to a decent life free of hunger, fear, and oppression. I believe in the duty of every member of society to strive to guarantee that right to all others. I believe that while we have no desire to place a ceiling over anyone's aspirations, we should desire to put a floor under everyone's needs, and I say that is patriotic. I believe ultimately in justice, not in perfection or idealized utopias, but in human justice. A justice that rejects, rejects the ascendancy of bombs over bread, of private greed over public good, of profits over people. A justice that centers on the preciousness of life, a justice that embraces the economic, the social, and political. And finally, I believe in the indivisibility of justice. It must be justice for them as well as for us, or it's not justice but mere favoritism. And I say all of that is patriotic. Now, I may sound like a philosopher, but what I'm interested in is change, getting the job done type change. So I believe in being practical. But I don't mean it in the sense of those who, the so-called progressive, the so-called progressives, who lower their sights, harden their hearts, darken their vision, and congratulate themselves on their realism. You know the saying, I dream dreams of things that never were and ask why not? We need to dream dreams of things that never were and ask how. What are the practical steps we can take today? We have to approach the world with steel in our eyes. But we can't let the steel in our eyes cloud the dream. We have to hold fast to the vision of what we as a people, what we as a nation can be, what we can do, and not settle for so many do for the hope that it will simply get no worse or even less, that it will get worse more slowly. Achieving that wide-ranging justice will not be easy, cheap, or convenient, but it is possible, and after all is said and done, it is just the right thing to do. And fighting that fight to establish justice is the very essence of what it means to be an American patriot. Now, I've come to a point in my life where I've begun to slow down. I don't have as much energy as I did. But the fact is, in spite of all that, and maybe even because of that, recently I've begun to look more at the dream than the steel. Despite it all, despite all logic, despite a mountain of evidence, and without any good reason, I still believe that things not only should be, but can be better than they are. I just do, and I will. I will continue to be a patriot. That's it. We're wrapping up today just with our final reminder, our weekly reminder. At least 5,580 people have been killed by guns in this country since Newtown. At least 57 of them in Massachusetts. That's it. Enjoy your fourth. Have the best week you can.